Hey, what's up, guys? And welcome to episode 76 of Talk 4, the quickfire podcast where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. That's me. And let me introduce our very, very special guest for today, Tom Trotter, who's going to be answering a few questions today. Tom, all I can say is welcome aboard the Talk 4 podcast. Please say hi to the fine people listening and just give us a quick rundown of who you are and what you do before I shoot some questions. Hello, fine people worldwide. Top of the top of the day to you, I guess there, Louie. It's (laughs) noon here in Vail, Colorado. And I'll just let me just tell you where I am because you see a ski picture behind me. I am sitting directly across. It is two miles away from me. The steepest, longest downhill in the world on the men's circuit. 2.2 2.2 miles in length, and they get up to about 85 miles an hour on the course. Wow. So that's where I am today, because that's where I came to get my knee surgery done. Mm. But let me tell you about myself. I grew up in Colorado, and that's uh, why I came back here to hang out in my old uh, my old state while I got surgery done. Mm-hmm. Grew up in Pueblo, Colorado. Now, Pueblo, Colorado was a steel town out on the plains of Colorado, not up in the mountains. And I, you know, we we were kind of a middle income family and uh, we had family of four. My dad was a World War II bomber pilot, B-29 pilot. Uh, He operated from the same airfield as the Enola Gay in a different squadron, largest airfield in the world, Tien Island. And he was truly my motivation behind wanting to learn to fly. Mm -hmm. I was always fascinated with aircraft. At the age of four, all I could think about was how do I become a pilot? I knew what I wanted to do from being a little guy. So there were no simulators at the time, but United Airlines would come out to Pueblo from the Denver Training Center and would do these, what I would call a box pattern of ground controlled approaches to the Pueblo airport. And I think the airport got 10 bucks or something for every time they landed. Hmm. And it was a quiet airport, but a great big one. And so I would go out there, hang on the chain link fence, watch the airplanes, do what they did. 707s, 727s, uh, DC-8s, all the uh, aircraft of the day. <laughs> and dream about flying. There, Like I said, you would, you would often hear sonic booms during the 1960s. I was born in 55, so I've been around a while. This is my 50th year of flying uh, coming up. And uh, so I've been flying a long time, Louie. So uh, my motivation was, how do I become an airline pilot? And, and in the end, that's the one thing I never did was get to become an airline pilot. But my brother went to the Naval Academy. I had no idea the Navy had airplanes. I never flew in a jet aircraft till I was 17 years old to go on an airliner somewhere. And uh, I got to fly when I was like 10 years old in the back right seat of somebody's Cherokee at the local airport. I was just always enthused and fascinated with flight. And so he came home and he had this one photograph of a TA-4 Skyhawk is what the Navy used for training. And I thought, wow, what, what is the Navy doing with airplanes? And he says, they land on ships. I had no idea they landed on ships. I thought the Air Force had all the airplanes. And at that point, I said, that's what I got to do. So I applied to go to the Naval Academy. They said, well, you're not you're not quite that smart. So I got a scholarship. I was an alternate to the <laughs> University of Colorado at Boulder. And so it was a very normal you know, course of going through college right after high school. Mm. And uh, so I skied and... You know, we got in a uniform once a week and you got the same commission as the people from the Naval Academy, came out of there, went off to flight school. So I started through flight school and it was it was only a four year commitment at that point. Did well enough to finish near the top of my class, got selected for the F-14 Tomcat, went to the East Coast, Oceana, Virginia, went through a Tomcat tour. And that tour took place during the time frame that the Iranian hostage crisis went down. We were sort of a backup ship to the Nimitz on the USS Eisenhower, got deployed to the Indian Ocean. Uh, it was the longest deployment of my naval career. That was I was in the Navy for 24 years. That 
that one deployment was nearly nine months. Maybe it was just a little bit more, but we only had, count them, five days off in nine months at sea. Jeez. Five days in Singapore. And if you don't think we didn't have a few drinks in Singapore, it was a very long deployment. So I was a Tomcat guy for that period. Then the F-18 came out while I was an instructor in the Tomcat. I opted to make the switch over to the uh, Hornet. You know, of course, I had to apply and it took some unique qualifications and I happened to have them. I was lucky enough to have them because mm. there are guys that uh, assist people landing on the ship called LSOs. So I had that qualification. So they said, hey, that's what we need. One guy from the East Coast, one for the West. I was in the first Navy F-18 squadron, first deployment of the aircraft. So that was 1985 is when that deployment was made. For the for 17 years, I flew the Hornet from the West Coast. Mm -hmm. My entire career was another, you know, seven. And in the entirety of my flying, <laughs> I, have to, I have to laugh about it. I, I never served in the Pentagon. So I guess that, that may be not very promotable way up. But I did fly in just about every single tour that I had, which I uh, I pride myself on. Got about 5,000 hours of tactical jet time, Tomcats, Hornet, variety of other aircraft that we can talk about. And then uh, 1,278 landings, about 38 combat missions into Iraq. So I achieved every goal that I ever had of dodging a desk and putting on a G-suit instead. So <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of mission. my maple career. So, <laughs> then I moved into the civilian side. We call it GA, general aviation. And I managed a private jet for a gentleman out of San Francisco. We flew all over the world. He had he had a company on the London Exchange. So we would come to London all the time. I was in London four or five times a year. I can't tell you how many times I've been to London. So I know I know the UK pretty well. So one wow. of my favorite my favorite cities is London. I I've been to a lot of your museums. That's great. Uh, it's a small world, isn't it? But right, let me let me shoot a couple of facts at you because I just want to just want to know what you think okay. about this. So, five thousand, like you said, five thousand hours in tactical jets, over a thousand carrier landings, seventeen thousand hours of flying. That comes up to seven hundred and six days. That's nearly two years, Tom. How how does that make you feel when you kind of after this career when you put into perspective that you've nearly been two years going in in jets and and planes how does that make you feel old <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah we had a saying in naval aviation you know particularly like flying fighters off boats because you take off and then you stay out there for a long time and you're not fighting all the time okay it's mm. not all that action oriented and there, so in that in all those hours of seventeen thousand hours of flying i you know there's hours and hours of boredom and then sometimes interrupted by a few moments of sheer terror but uh you know <laughs> like i just came i just went over to cork and venice here recently and i mean you know those are six and seven hours of idle chit chat and having a nice meal and because uh, i fly a business jet at this point okay so you know some of it's pretty benign and then the the wonderful part of my life right now is i fly i've flown nine different aircraft for the company that i fly for mm -hmm. and so we've got this what i call this high low mix we got little airplanes that land back country you know dirt strips and then we've got corporate Gulf streams. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's really fun to do this mix across the board. So uh, I get, and then we have a military aircraft, the PC nine. I think I sent you a picture of that. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful yeah. airplane to go out for an old guy and put some G's on and, uh, you know, go straight up and down and chase, chase some of our neighbors around up there in Wyoming with our aircraft. But yeah, I've been blessed. Um, I did have one ejection uh, in the Tomcat early on in my career but uh you know i was i used to I used to tell people they said oh you ejected so you know what was that like and i always say i just sum it up with well i used to be about six foot one now i'm five eight and i was very handsome at one point and now i'm a little ugly 
So, you know, it'll kind of beat you up. <laughs> but uh, I've been fortunate, you know, I've dodged a few bullets. Uh, we'll just say some of these guys, some of the people shooting at me weren't very good shots, I guess. <laughs> but uh, it's been a, great, been a great ride. I've, and I've, like I said, I've flown so many different aircrafts, gliders, helicopters. Yeah. You know, I got a few different stories for a variety of them. Yeah, some people call that the stormtrooper aim syndrome, I think. <laughs> but anyway, look, so when I was doing my kind of the research and the background checks and sort of like the articles and just having a look at who you are and what you've done, I think one one press article referred to you as Top Gun's Top Gun. Would you say that's an accurate yeah. statement? And um, I know that you're a member of something called the Grand Club as well, which is something I think some people who get a thousand carrier landings become a part of. So, yeah, describe that as well. OK, two different questions. Oh, the, the, yeah, the, uh, I took a group of young people that were these YouTube sensations. So they put this thing together and they kind of described me as he wasn't Tom Cruise. He's Tom Cruise's captain. <laughs> <laughs> they, were pretty funny. they all wanted to go out and pull a lot of G's and have some fun. But, uh, you know, and that, that kind of takes me back to the whole Top Gun thing. When I went through Top Gun, it was 1985. There had been no first Top Gun movie, young Tom Cruise. But I was lieutenant. He went through as lieutenant. Okay. So that took place. And I remember when they were creating it, several of my friends are in the movie. And then uh, it was a sensation. Then we go to the other movie. I'm, I'm far from having been in the Navy. You know, I'd been out of the Navy for 22 years by the time the second one gets created. But he comes back as a Navy captain. So it's sort of funny. I go, well, it's kind of come full circle. You know, Cruz, just I was the captain, but he he was not representing being the captain of Top Gun, but he was a Top Gun pilot. Right. So he comes back to do this special mission and all. So, uh, yeah, it does kind of come full circle, but I was in charge. I did, I did go through as a student, just like the 1987 movie. And I was a Navy captain, but never recalled to active duty to, you know, solve some difficult mission. But sure. uh, I was in charge of the school as a Navy commander. So one rank below captain. Talk to and us as about far that. As yeah. brand, How did that come as about? As far as the brand goes, yeah. let's talk about that for a second. Cause you asked. Sure. That's it takes 20, 22 years to get to a thousand carrier landings. Some some people have pulled it off in maybe 18 or 19 years, but you have to have an alignment of being at sea a lot and having opportunities to go land on the ship quite a bit. So mine was in my 21st year, 22nd year. I did it with a family relative, believe it or not. Uh, my wife's cousin was in the back seat. Oh, wow. He was my Rio. And it was a night mission, dropping some bombs. We came back to the boat. I made a I made a, a good enough play for the three wire, I guess, because we all looked to land on the three wire, have an okay pass, and then we cut a cake and celebrate. But uh, I really didn't want it to happen at night. But my logbook fell out that way. I was like, oh no, I got to go out and fly the Tomcat at night, late in my career, because I flew it at the beginning and then I flew it again at the end of my career. So, uh, yeah. To be part of the Grand Club is pretty cool. There's a gigantic brass plaque down at the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, and your name goes up on the wall forever. So that's one of my very proud achievements. It was always a goal, but you don't know that you can actually get there. Can you put into perspective how how many people roughly have achieved that to be part of the Grand Club? Like, If you had to say, do you know like a rough estimate of how many people have actually achieved this? You know, I don't know. There's a count for pilots and there's a count for the naval flight officers. Right. They're, they're two different groups. And I know the vast majority are, that are on the board, you know, and naval aviation has been around since 1911. So after 110 years of doing this, there's actually a Brit that I understand has more carrier landings than any Navy guy. So you might check that one out because you guys... <laughs> used to have yeah so supposedly he far exceeded i think he's the only person with 2000 but i'd have to find that wow. historically but it's i would say it's sort of a one percent kind of thing uh right. it's 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 only a few pages when they put your name in a column and so how many people have been tailhook embarked on carrier navy pilots 
the vast majority get out of the Navy. So they never, you know, they may have 200, 300 carrier landings at the end of their eight year career. So getting a thousand is hard. Mm. And, you know, sometimes their budget cuts and it gets even harder. So I'd say it's kind of a 1% thing, but I'd, I'd have to ask uh, the Naval Aviation Museum about that one. Sounds good. Yeah, I'd love to know about that, actually, because, I mean, it's it's an incredible achievement. And um, obviously, yeah. like you mentioned and touched on already, one of your other incredible achievements, I mean, to be a commander of anything in the military is just amazing. But when you have something like Top Gun, which is regarded as such a prestigious thing, I mean, that's just one hell of an accolade. So I'm just fascinated. So tell us about it. You were a commander at Top Gun. So can you tell us how that came about for you? And uh, what were your objectives and responsibilities as the commander? Because obviously Top Gun is a, it's a school. So what were your sort of, what were the yeah. tasks there? Uh, well, let's, let me tell you how it kind of, it leads, leads up to becoming the CEO of Top Gun. Sure. So throughout my entire Naval career, there's nothing I wanted more than to be a Blue Angel. I applied two different times. Once as a junior officer to be on the team, did not get selected. I applied to be the commanding officer of the Blue Angels. I was selected as a finalist. I went down and I interviewed and I didn't get chosen. So I always say one door closes and another opened. And so I came back from that a little disappointing, but you know, that's the way it goes. But, you know, I did throw my hat in the ring. It was something I always wanted to do. I thought, you know, I think I'd be good at this. I had a lot of time in the Hornet at that stage, but that's the way it goes. Breaks of naval air, we say. So this opportunity came up and I got a call and I said, hey, would you think about being the CEO of Top Gun? I thought, wow, sure I would. So I had to submit some articles that I had written, put a little resume together. I think it was a three-star admiral that was going to choose who was going to be the uh, next CEO of Top Gun. But what was unique about my resume was the fact that I had flown the Tomcat and I had over a thousand hours in the Tomcat at that stage and I had it instructed in it. Every commanding officer at Top Gun, 19 of them that preceded me were, well, they were fighter pilots, but they were primarily F-4 and F-14, mostly F-14 pilots. So now we were in this transition to where the F- 18 was more dominant on the flight deck and in the fleet. And they said, hey, it's probably a good time to flip it over to the F-18 community to have, you know, the commanding officer be that. So I had already commanded an F-18 squadron, the VFA-151 Vigilantes. And it was off of that tour that they said, okay, you've already commanded a squadron. This is a different unit. It's larger. We had about 35 airplanes when I showed up there, a mix of planes. We had F-16s, we had F-14s, F-18s. So this hybrid, and most of your uh, most of your people that work for you are civilians, believe it or not, and some Navy. But the staff were Navy and Marine Corps, the pilots and the NFOs, okay, the, the Rios. Mm -hmm. So it's a very unique position. It was down at Miramar. I was the last uh, commanding officer at Miramar in San Diego, and I was fortunate enough to be selected. So I was the 20th commanding officer of, of Top Gun in San Diego, but I was also the guy that ran up to Fallon, Nevada to stick a shovel in the ground and go, okay, let's start the building of the academic facility and the hangar there. And, you know, of course, Fallon's a long ways from uh, Miramar. And that's where you see much of the second movie. That's that's the Fallon Ranges, uh, high desert, we call it, up just to the east of Reno. Mm -hmm. So that was my job. And uh, I was chosen. I was fortunate. It wasn't the biggest job that I had in the Navy. I, I was later on, a few years later, chosen to be an air wing commander. And that's when you have nine squadrons, about 2,200 people, and then you're embarked on a carrier. To me, that was that was the real gem in the crown of my naval career was to command a carrier air wing. Be called the CAG. That's the, that's the term, a carrier air group commander. And so I, I think anybody... You know, in tactical aviation, their aspiration is to say, hey, I'd love to lead a squadron. Getting Top Gun was fantastic, but to be an air wing commander was frosting on the cake. So that was uh, that was the culmination of my career. And that amazing. What a just, just amazing. And um, you know what? Something I want to ask now, just a bit of trivia, then just a fun little question. So 
uh for me I, i've played a, a sport called airsoft for for many years and um, i've picked up loads of like the patches and they're all kind of jokes and flags and uh kind of different bits and bobs i got one from when i went flying in the l39 and there was a cool yeah. patch there and when i went out to see wiz uh the top gun pilot who I went flying with he had a, a an amazing patch wall in the place where in his hangar and it was just full of like the, you know the top gun flight school and the red course things and the thousand hours and the hornets and stuff i'm just wondering so you must have got so many of these kind of things and patches and stuff from all these achievements you've accomplished is there like an insane patch wall just somewhere with you or what did you do with all these things is there like a cabinet or just tell me you know it's funny because literally by the end of a 20 career 20 year career 24 year career you'd have hundreds of these things, you know, because some of them are funny that, that, you know, it'd be like a certain weapon and they'd have a patch for that weapon, AGM-88, the harm missile. And so they'd have a patch, you know, and so guys that didn't have, uh, you know, much experience in anything, they have all these patches of, you know, some of them were just like walking advertisements for a missile. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then you know, they were very significant. So when you distill it down and you, you know, you wear your, green flight jacket not the leather one we had two jackets but if you take it and you go what are the things that you want to be seen with on that jacket one are your navy wings and you know maybe your top gun name tag your cag name tag or your commanding officer name tag and so those were both unique and cherished that you would have at the end of your career the other would be maybe the command that you had had. So if you had an air wing, it had a certain shape and color to it. I was CAG too, and it was a, a sword. And so, uh, and then the other one that everybody is very proud of, that's the hardest one to get, is the Top Gun patch. Now, there are, there are two types of patches. One's as an adversary. They come through our program to learn how to be adversaries against you know, the, the good guys versus the bad guys. Yeah. But the Top Gun patch is earned going through the school. And you have to understand that pa the number of patch wearers in a given year, in terms of, I always, I, I looked at it one time and I said, okay, wait, there are about 850 Hornet pilots that are out there. Then we, we were phasing out the Tomcat. So just short of a thousand people are flying the airplane. And in a given year, there would be like, 48 patches given out. Wow. So that's a small group of patches, patch wearers. And anybody that had a Top Gun patch, it was in a very distinctive position. It was always in the same place. You would have on one shoulder, you'd have the number of hours that you had in a certain model of aircraft. And you got, you got a patch at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 in model. And then you'd have a Top Gun patch, your name, and the unit. And those would kind of be the four main ones that you'd wear. And then they'd give patches out for being in the top 10 landing competition and stuff like that. Right. So, yeah, the patch, patches are kind of a big deal. I can imagine, yeah. I mean, the huge accolades and stuff. And it really is, is a big showing of things that people have done. It's kind of like the trophies almost in a sense, really, isn't it? Um, so just a little side question as well before we move on to the next kind of big question. Just something I'm thinking about now. So you, throughout your career, you must have known so many fighter pilots. I mean, so many. I'm just interested. Mm -hmm. So if you take like the Top Gun graduates of the, the actual Top Gun school and stuff, you've obviously seen a lot of them. That's the commander. You, you would have seen them all going through. Did you notice something profoundly different about them in their personality traits from the other pilots because obviously the description of top gun is the top one percent of its pilots is something above the norm so did you see something in the way that they acted as a person like in their personality traits that made them more exceptional than just the normal fighter pilots just interested let me let me give you a little progression the year i went into flight school two thousand of us went in that year they expected to wing 900 to 1,000, okay? Mm -hmm. So they always said when you get in the class, they go, look left, look right. One of you is not going to be sitting here at the end. Okay, so that's half will be gone. Then you say, okay, that half gets winged. Then they go to all their different areas. So only so many go to jets, okay? So that's a smaller group again. Most uh, pilots in the Navy are helicopter pilots. They're like over 50%. So a small group goes to jets, 
Then a smaller yet group would go to Tomcats. And then later on, the Hornet came out. And now there's a lot of F-18s, but it gets smaller and smaller. Then you say, okay, now you're in an F-18 squadron. There might be 17 pilots in an F-18 squadron that have 12 airplanes. Mm -hmm. And so that's a small cadre. So of 5,000 people on the ship, only 36 of them, you know, 36 to 40 are dropping the bombs. You know, so the the officers are the ones that are going off the pointy end of the boat and doing the the business end of things by dropping bombs and shooting missiles. So it's, you know, there are 5,000 people. So we only have this small cadre that are getting the war fighting done, but everything else is in support to that. So the numbers are small. Then when you say, okay, we'd have 800 people that are flying the F-18. Then we select this small group each year. Then from that, we'd only select four to six new instructors per year. Maybe eight would be a lot in one year. So think about eight people in the entire Navy, maybe only six in a given year, would be selected to be top gun instructors. So at the time I was there, my staff was about 36. And I'd say of F-18 guys, there were probably 18 to 20. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very, very select group of that thousand that are out there. And I, I to, to tell you the quality of that individual, or let's just say the capability, their, you know, just ingrained sense of, you know, maneuvering the airplane and getting it to a certain place and in three dimensions, the maneuvering ability, just like the, the Blue Angels are kind of one program. It's, it's very disciplined flying, but it's air showmanship and Top Gun pilots were like, these are the best of the best and guys that could just, I mean, they'd take you out. They'd, they'd kick your ass so fast you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I, I always tell the story of, I thought I was pretty good. I went in there. I had thousands more hours than the other guys did that came in, my my staff. And so I thought, you know, I want to I want to fight the best guys. So I said, oh, OK. <laughs> you now, I'm a commander, been in the Navy. You know, I'm in my 30s, I think, you know, in my prime. And I said, okay, well, we got we got this one guy. <laughs> we'll send you out with him. And uh, I'll tell you, Louie, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> he kicked my ass in about, you know, a long fight. Uh, one versus one is two minutes long. That's a long fight. Wow. A short fight might be 45 seconds. But uh, this guy was so good. And he knew exactly what my next move was going to be and <laughs> totally anticipated where I was going, knew within five knots of what my speed was. I was like, oh, my God. And I go, yeah, he's really good. He's amazingly good. I have a lot to learn. <laughs> so, But my role as the commanding officer was not to go out and beat up on students. It was to you know, really sell the program and what the program is all about, go to Washington, D.C. And I, I was the CEO marketing the thing. You know, so I was the salesman of the class and the course that they had just created. So the genius is it, it, and the uh, the productivity all lies within these lieutenants. And uh, they were really, really good at what they did. Wow. I mean, yeah, it sounds like it. Oh, God, that's funny. I'll tell you what, I'd love to do a dogfight one day. But I thought I always thought they were longer than that. Though. Like in, in my head, I would have always thought it was a bit longer than that. But wow, interesting to think that the things can kind of change and that can be over so quickly. And well, but yeah, yeah, the fight would go on longer than that. Now, yeah. you know, you might have a setup and there was a very well done one by the, the uh, F-14 community one that where the uh, Mark Fox call sign Mert. If you get a chance to listen to that, he describes this mission going into Iraq. I think day two of Desert Storm going to, I, I, they called it, they had a name for the field, but it was, I think it was Talil. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we attacked it later on, but he describes this engagement. Now it takes a long time to describe it, but he's describing minutes, minutes, but he breaks it down as to what's going on and all the stuff that's happening. So, you know, we would, a mission into Iraq, you know, it might take four, three, four hours to do, but you're taking off, you're tanking, you're joining the group, you're going in country, and then you come back, that you tank on, and then you attack, or you don't, you tank on the backside. It's a very long evolution. You might be going seven, eight hundred miles each direction. So, but if you engage someone, that terminal part, which is done probably around at 20, 20 miles every minute, Everybody's going Mach 1. 
that that that's one minute to close 20 miles. And these, you know, they may pop up on radar 40 miles away. There you are. You're mm. uh, you're a couple minutes away from engaging the guy and passing him and then trying to figure out on radar. What is he? Who is he? Is he one of us? Is he one of them? Is it somebody that's turned into the strike group, you know, the wrong direction? So it's I may tell you the, the time compression and how fast it happens. Just watching it, having another airplane pass you at, you know, when we we have closure of say twelve hundred knots, it's it's unbelievable, and you're five hundred feet away from a person is the rule. We couldn't close five hundred feet from metal to metal or graphite to graphite. You yeah. know, when you engage them. So it's uh yeah, it's 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 pretty it's pretty fun stuff to tell you the truth when we when we when we do it you know, in, in practice, you know, mock, mock combat is, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty, uh, intense to say the least. Yeah, I can imagine. And especially with like the advancements now in the kind of the anti-radar stuff as well, it must be getting harder and harder to identify what's actually on that radar too, especially now considering all of how things are advancing so quickly. But yeah, if we, if we talk about like the reality side of Top Gun then, so obviously during your time at Top Gun, the first movie was coming out. Um, and obviously that was insanely successful. Like it, it, it was huge. It, it blew up. It was everywhere. Um, how different was the culture of the real Top Gun and the classes in the day to day life? from What was portrayed in these movies and in the reality of Top Gun? Would you describe it more as like a fighter pilot boot camp or more of like the Harvard of military aviation? Well, the, the, the class had changed from when I was there. It was short. It was five weeks and we'd work six days a week so there's one of the big differences it's you know we, we may go over to the club on saturday night and have a beer mm -hmm. but it's not all the frivolity that you saw in the movie that everybody's at the bar and you're briefing in the hangar that it doesn't happen you know the the briefing uh spaces are very professional you know we go through the mission and you know anyone anyone flight's going to take you know, half the day. If you flew twice, you'd be there for a 12 hour day. So by the time you're done, you go back to our, uh, your living quarters, study up some more, crash out, but it's, it's very intense. Then the later course, when I was the commanding officer became 10 weeks in length. I'm pretty certain that's what it was because we try to do four per year. So it was really grueling. There were some, some weeks that we'd fly seven days a week. And so we're doing it up on the, you know, instrumented ranges and recreating it. And, and so boot camp to me is that's when you're just starting out. These aren't people that are starting out. These are people that are about seven or eight years and have probably got a thousand hours in type. So in an F-18. And so they come to you with a, you know, a stellar reputation and they're pretty good at what they do. We just take them to the next level. Yeah. But it's a very intense course. Nothing like the movie. Nothing like the movie. So that's that's Hollywood. Everybody's chasing the girls. They're down at the club, throwing each other into the sand and playing volleyball or football or something. And, it, you know, I don't know that we even had a softball game at the end of these things. We did between the staff, but we never had much time. It, it wasn't built around beach time fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood will be Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Some of the egos were a little bit similar, but you know the the need for speed and high fiving and all that. That's kind of like oh, you know, <laughs> they just go out and get the job done. We come back and and discuss it. You was know, it true that up. there was a fine for mentioning the the music and any reference to the movies in the Top Gun? Because that's what Wiz said. He said there was like a fifty dollar fine that went into the drinking fund if you dared to mention Danger Zone or something. Was that true? <laughs> You know, there was there there was a little spin-off to the first movie. And I think somebody did have some input to the script and they had seen the script and they go, eh, this is not the way they talk. And so yeah, there was somebody that was kind of inside the staff. And so that person took and kind of helped rewrite it and would listen to the little quips and quotes. So I, I do say that the first movie, if you sat through it, you kind of went, oh, <laughs> they they know some of the things that we say. <laughs> <laughs> ballistic and out of control you know that's a term you know uh the need for speed is we wouldn't say the need for speed we always used to say speed is life so that's a you know no there's no points for second place uh you know it's uh 
Yeah, there, there was no Top Gun trophy. <laughs> so it was it was a, you know we were it was a team getting you know pulling to get uh, you know our students through, and then really the the whole concept is you take the students who have a very high skill set and level and you elevate that then they go back to their school or their squadron and they're the teachers as a result of having become discipline disciples of the school so they would go out and then they would branch out and go everywhere else in the navy marine corps and put out here are the tactics and here are the here here's how they go about executing a top gun so then everybody's doing the same thing yeah. So you would have an East Coast carrier that you'd meet in the Indian Ocean with a West Coast carrier. We knew how they operated. We and we might have dual battle group operations. We know exactly how they operate. We'd, we'd know people that were over there. So, you know, they'd come from one side of the world. We'd come from the other, and we'd operate the same. So, that was really kind of the concept. Just something I want to ask then, because listening to what you're saying, I I have to say I find this so so interesting. Would you say that the kind of the objective of Top Gun was to create fighter pilots to go and fight at the best of their ability, or was it to create teachers to pass on these things? What was the what what was the priority there? Do you think, or like the, the long goal? The answer was B: create teachers, and then pass on the knowledge. You take the best of the best. That's true, and then they then go out and it's it's they seed and spread the word. And the knowledge base rises, you know, and out of out of Top Gun and the way that we put this syllabus together, every not only did every aviation community emulate it, and it was a strike fighter tactics instructor program under a strike fighter weapons tactics gigantic plan. And so what they did is we said, okay. When somebody starts here in naval aviation, and then the product that we want 12 or 14 years from now is somebody that is a strike leader, here's a little fledgling, he knows how to fly on the wing. That's about it. And then later on, we want him to lead a multinational strike into some foreign country. Now that's, you know, that takes a long time to build that individual. But it was a continuum, cradle to grave. I didn't like the grave part, but uh, you know, it's 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 over your career. And so that was the concept. And then every other community embraced it, whether it was a destroyer or uh, submarines. They went, wow, we hadn't thought this through. How do we start somebody at the beginning of their career knowing that what is that end goal? To command a sub, to command an air wing. In our case, it was to lead lead a strike. That's just, I, I have to say, like my mind is just, I'm, I'm loving this right now because it's so amazing. But so... <laughs> It's like if we put it into a nutshell or something. So if we, what the movies kind of did almost for me, like in my head, they kind of made it look like it was this kind of exclusive club of people who are like the best in the world that you send to the toughest missions. A bit like almost like the Navy SEALs, almost of the aviation side of things. But would yeah. you say then that actually the ultimate objective of Top Gun wasn't to create like a an exclusive club? It was actually to improve the entirety of of the aviation in the Navy. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was to raise the level of excellence wow. is what it amounted to. And so it's not a club, you know, we, you, you have a patch and you're a patch where no one ever described it as a club. A club is one of these things that you go, Oh, I don't know why he got in the club <laughs> you know? or, Oh, she's related to so and so. That's how they got into the club. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. no club. <laughs> it's it's all achieved. It's all based on you know. You better be pretty good. Yeah. You've got to be. You've got to prove yourself. And believe it or not, it, just because you got sent there did not mean that you would get through the program. Mm. We didn't uh, graduate everybody that came through. So there was a, a level of achievement. And progress checks all along the way with validating, are they worthy of being patch wearers and moving on to teaching? So they've got to be able to dissect the mission and explain it and, and tell us, you know, this is what I, this is what went well. This is, we used to call it goods and others. So over here on the good side, this is how it went. Uh, these are the things I could improve upon. And there was never a mission that didn't have things that were in that other category. 
you know, even if it was something administrative with, oh, we we walked five minutes too late, you know, and, and that kind of got us a little behind our timeline or whatever. They were very critical, but we never put anything in the category of this was good and this was bad. We never talked about bad. So it was a, it was a mindset of, hey, we're, we're dealing with really good people. And so we'll break it down that way. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'll I tell you what, I love that. I mean, it's just so interesting. It's like one of these things where we go through this conversation and then it's just like, click, hang on a minute. This is something to create a whole the whole navy and improvement there but with the kind of the wording they have in like the movies and stuff at the beginning when they sort of describe it it almost makes it feel slightly like it's along the side of it's to create almost like warriors in a sense an exclusive sort of warrior thing a bit like the people he would send to you know the very special like the special special ops basically but actually it it was a long-term scheme and strategy to create a higher level of the whole navy which i just find so yeah. a, a, amazing across a continuum that that had some a legacy to it yeah but then got us to the next level. And that was the really cool part. And then we would exchange ideas with the Air Force Fighter Weapons School. So we always were collaborating with our counterparts up at Nellis. So they'd come down or I'd go up and then we'd kind of go through our syllabus. As the weapons changed, then you say, okay, how are we moving from, you know, what the Sparrow missile to maybe AMRAM, the F-14 goes away with the AIM-54 Phoenix. Okay, what's the next weapon? How do we go next aircraft, F-35? What, what's the best way that we integrate the F-35 in with Super Hornet? There's another airplane, you know, I never saw him fly off the ship that you've probably seen it. That's that stealthy little guy. Mm -hmm. The X-4, it looks like a miniature B-2. The X-47, I think it's called. I might have that wrong. But it goes up to the catapult on its own, you know, and it takes off on its own. It stays out there for a while and it it can take on the toughest missions. It carries a weapon. Yeah. So it's, you know, so how do you integrate all that in at the same time? So that the speeds match one another and they integrate everybody. So it's, you know, I'll give you an example. We did a strike into Iraq. We had 24 different targets. We had 120 aircraft involved. It went over a very broad area. I'd say it's 400 by 600 miles. Mm -hmm. We hit every target within two minutes. The vulnerability window opened at zero. And 120 seconds later, we were gone. Wow. So think about that. 24 targets were hit, 24 of them destroyed, and we swept in, swept out with a huge number of aircraft. It was all integrated. Not much is heard or said. You know, you just do things through data link and that sort of thing. In you go and out you go. But that might have been a three or four hour mission. Mm -hmm. So and you come in and, you know, at a relatively high speed in the terminal portion of it, usually around 540 or so is the last part of it uh, before you release your weapons. Wow. And then supersonic going out, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, just. So a lot of coordination. Yeah. See, how do you how do you integrate that? I counted up. I, I think I, I put together, I said, with the battle group, well, there, are, there are probably fifteen or 18,000 people that are involved directly or indirectly. Although it's a handful of airplanes that go up there, but everything else that supports it, and you know it's being watched in the Pentagon when that mission goes down. Uh, it was called Gunsmoke. We did that. That was a mission we went in. I I went in way in advance to plan it out, you know, as the senior guy to go into, uh, into uh, I think we went into Saudi Arabia to discuss it. And then, you know, we did it. It was into Iraq. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it takes a lot of teamwork. There can yeah. be at one, one small element that goofs everything up, you know, wrong frequency. Oh, you know, something didn't get keyed correctly. You know, there's a lot of stuff that can throw a wrench into it yeah absolutely um i've become aware that this is going to be a long podcast but i really don't care because i'm loving this conversation <laughs> so much um I've, something's just popped into my head then so thinking that going down this kind of line of talk with the whole top gun thing obviously it's a very smart scheme then to create this whole thing that then improves the quality of the entirety of the navy so do you do you think or do you know or have you, maybe you can't even speak about it i don't even know but do you think that there is an equivalent of what Top Gun is in the opposing countries like China and stuff? Do you think that they have the equivalent of that or or is Top Gun really like one of a kind to the, to the state? You know, I don't know. They may, Louis. I don't know because <laughs> it's funny, you know, when we if we look at a Chinese carrier, 
you know, they have all the same colored jackets on people that have the same jobs on the flight deck. So the directors are in yellow and the people that are putting ordinance on are in red. And so they replicate everything. They do. But do they really know how it's all done? You know, how, you know, it's like, it's sort of like, uh, do they really know how to dance the dance? You know, so, and they've never had, you know, that many carriers. And it's been a difficult thing to say, oh, well, we can, you know, it's just like a, it's just like a computer. We can stamp out a million more of these, but I don't know how hard, how easy it is to replicate it. But uh, I, I, our adversaries in the area of carriers and nuclear carriers, uh, I don't, you know, I, I couldn't tell you that. Is it, do they have a Top Gun equivalent? They probably try to, you know, they have flight demonstration teams that, you know, they try to, you know, make it as good as the Blue Angels, but nobody is as good as the Blue Angels. You know, the Thunderbirds do a different type of program, but nobody flies as close together as the Blue Angels, which is kind of their, you know, the hallmark of, of what they do. Sure. So, yeah, it's... Uh, it's an interesting. Probably. It's an interesting thing, isn't it, to think about it? But I hope yeah, you didn't just give them an idea, there, Louis. <laughs> Imagine that and be responsible for that. Uh oh, <laughs> shields <laughs> up. Okay. Well, anyway, um, before we move on, just just a quick one then. So while we're on the topic of like the movies and stuff, um, what what did you think about that? And um, if I'm going to ask a question, it's going to have to be, what did you think that the new movie really sort of topped the old movie on? And what maybe were some of the things that you think that the old movie retained the crown in and in, in the quality of it? Okay, I'll, 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 I'm going to make it really simple. All right. Do you know how many times I've seen the first movie? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna guess. take a pot shot. I'm gonna say once. <laughs> Get in you got a hundred percent on that. <laughs> now how many how many times do you think I've seen the second movie? Um I know it's gonna have to be a lot more. I, it depends how keen you were for it though. Uh, <laughs> six? Six to eight. <laughs> I think I think it was three times in like ten days. <laughs> <laughs> the next person would say, "Hey, let's go see it." And I said, "Okay, I'll go." Because to me, the quality of the flying was so good, and it was, and 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 I think that you know the the air pack commander, this this uh, this gent that we flew together in the navy, he was in a squadron with me. He was younger than me, of course. We, you know, then they go on to become three star admirals, and he was really in charge. His name was uh, Chip Miller, call sign Bullet. And he and I talked on the phone. He says, Hey, Trots, that was my, my call sign. He goes, it, you, you aren't gonna, This movie is so cool. He says, You're not going to believe it because we have now seen all the video come back, but the movie is, it's going to blow you out of the water. I was like, Yeah, okay, let's see. And he goes, No, you're going to see. They've got like seven cameras, seven of these high resolution IMAX cameras are inside the plane, outside the plane, they're all over the place. He goes, and he says, and then the flying is really good. And it's, he says, you'll see some places that you know. And I thought I was the only guy that knew where to go this through this one little gap up in the Sierras, but sure enough, you know, that's one of the things that crews went through upside down. I go, shoot, that's my little spot that only I knew about. But <laughs> anyhow, uh, but the movie, you know, cinematography, it's, quantum leap over what it used to be what do we say 35 years between movies something like that and and so you know the hollywood stuff's the same okay you know we all run around the bar chase around i thought that the intro was good with the mach 10 airplane mm. man i felt like i was in the cockpit i was like well, my you know my chest is pounding I'm like, this thing's gonna come apart <laughs> it's like it, it's gonna overheat when you get it up there at mach 10 but i thought that was really well done and then just this afternoon, I was watching the Tomcat scene of chasing him down the canyon and the Tomcat against these fifth generation airplanes. The fifth generation airplanes were very cool. They were very like representative of what a fifth gen airplane would look like, like a like a modern F-22. It was like, woo, this is a cool looking jet that he's fighting. And some of the maneuvers are some of the maneuvers that some of those aircraft can actually pull off, you know, which is, we call it the Cobra maneuver mm. or it's. They do what they call a pedal turn in the F-22. The F-22 can do stuff like no airplane out there. And I'll admit that. It is an amazing airplane. So I thought that cinematography, I go to it again. Somebody calls me this afternoon. Hey, what are you up to? Oh, yeah, let's go. 
No, <laughs> I haven't seen it in IMAX theater yet. The music, I liked the first one better than I did the second one. The first one, I knew a bunch of the people, but it was a gigantic recruitment tool for the Navy. We had way too many people applying to become naval officers, naval flight officers. Surplus. You couldn't get into the Navy. It was so popular at, in 1987. Just surge. Today, I don't know that that movie has done, you know, we don't put movies out to recruit people, but it's a nice offshoot of the movie is yeah. to increase recruitment. And I think recruitment is, it's pretty tough right now, you know, so it's uh, not a good atmosphere for finding highest quality people and the commitment is long. So, you know, there's the contrast between the two. <laughs> I heard that the um, some of the recruiters were actually waiting outside the cinemas <laughs> to recruit people. <laughs> which which movie? Uh, the, the Top Gun Maverick, I think, is the, the success oh, of the, yeah. the first movie. I think that they were trying to kind of jump on that opportunity and you can see why. Yeah. I mean, I walked out of the theater yeah. and I thought, okay, A, I yeah. want to be a fighter pilot, B, I want to get one on the podcast. And that's how obviously all of this kind of happened. So very cool. But right. So one more little bit about the movie then. So was there anything in that movie, like the, the new one, the, the one that's just come out, um, was there anything in that movie that particularly stuck out to you like, yeah, that's just that's just not on. That's not right. Like one of the things for me was that one of the people oh. I had on the podcast was um, a guy <laughs> called Kegan Gill Smurf, ejected at the speed of sound out of a, out of an F eighteen, and um, mm. and his body was just torn to yeah. pieces. Yeah. Incredible survival story. But you've got Maverick going at Mark ten point three yeah. in the, in that, and it appears he ejects. Surely he's just dust at that point so was there anything like that that you think was uh just like okay that's just not that's not reality at all <laughs> that would not be reality but uh <laughs> you know somebody told me something interesting they go they, they, we we're talking about that ejection and they go oh no here's the really deep thinking part of that ejection and i said oh okay what's that and they go okay you remember how he walks into the diner and everybody's sitting there and he's all tattered up you know, and it's like he had just ejected from this Mach 10 airplane. He's actually in a dream. And so that never happened. I go, wow, <laughs> I guess I don't know how to think deep enough on in the next movie. I said, oh, my God. So, no, the one that does that does uh, would be beyond there. There are two of them I'm going to tell you about. One's real and one I think is fake. Uh, you know, of course, the, the uh, chasing the Tomcat. You know how they did that. It was pretty well done, but it's not real, most likely. But the other one was when the F-18, the two students are together and they're kind of going, you know, they're going to meet, you know, the old guy, Maverick. Yep. yep. Sort of like he's down below and he comes up in between them. You wouldn't do that. That would be a big no-no. Uh, you don't split a section of pilots, even if they were in a mild combat spread and you'd surprise them coming up in between them. That's just something that it would be uh, really against the rules of engagement. And it's a big no-no. You can't penetrate. You know, the, the setups are very controlled. Yeah. So that wouldn't happen. So that's kind of a stretch. The one that was not a stretch, and I got it explained to me in great detail, was there's an the opening trailer when, when that F-18 comes across the desert, which... All of us that have gone up and dropped bombs in this spot, it's called Bravo 20. When he's coming into this place called Lone Rock across the desert and the dust is coming up from the plane from behind it. Yeah. I said, I, I challenged the guy that was in charge. I said, how low was he? And I go, he was really low, wasn't he? And he goes, okay, here's the deal. Here's the deal. And he said, and, and they talked about it. They said, you know, Cruz was the director and he said he wanted this they they did it at you know the usual heights that an F-18 is limited to in the fleet. And they go, it just didn't have the pizzazz to it that being lower would. So he says, we took it, we went from 200 down to 100. So we cut it in half. Here we are here, here we are there. Right. And they said, it still wasn't low enough. <laughs> so we found this guy. He was a Blue Angel, lead solo, had just come off the team, had been on the team a couple different times. He's a commander, getting ready to go into retirement. And they go... And this was his sole deal to go do. And so he, I think they told me it was 23 different takes for that one shot. I might be wrong, but he's lower and lower and lower. And I, so I said to me, I said, looking at it, 
My guess is he's between about 20 and 50 feet, but probably on the average of 40 feet above the ground. And they go, eh, you're right. And it's like, that's low. Uh -huh. That's incredibly low to do 500 or so across the ground. And then, because you can tell, you know, for those of us that know the performance and see that in the, the high G pull up, and then he goes into burner and all the dust goes everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, tell you, I get so excited about every time I watch that. It's incredible. And so to capture that, you know, with you're under the wing coming across the desert and it just, that takes your heart rate sensitive. That's real. It was real. So it was like very well done. I but love that. Very controlled. And they decremented, you know, to say, okay, we're going to make this. This, and, and that was the demands on Tom Cruise's part from our stand to say, I want it to be really dramatic. And it was, to say the least, they really pulled one off. That's crazy. And credit to that pilot. He was really good. Really good. That takes, because it's just a, a fraction of a second, the bump of the stick, you're hitting the ground. Because there is there is no room for error at 35 feet. I can imagine. I mean, I'm six feet tall. So, I mean, I'm just thinking about a few of me stacked on top of each other. That's kind of low. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's crazy. But yeah. right then. So <laughs> I'm excited for this one. So last question then. Um, you've flown in excess of, like we said, 17,000 hours and around 240 different aircraft and helicopters. Um, in all your time airborne, what have been some of your best memories? And um, any cooler than cool itself moments, really touching or amazing <laughs> times that stick out in your memory? Maybe just like a little story to, to send our viewers away with some thoughts for? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have a few that I kind of I kind of reflected on. It's like, okay, how do I capture some of the best or the most that you know that, that were sort of surprises? Uh, and I'll give you I'll give you a few of them. Uh, we'll start with uh, late '80s. We're kind of you know we're feeling pretty good about our F-18s. We're going to go up into the into the North Pacific and test them in the Bering Sea with an exercise with the Air Force. And so we go up there and. You can imagine what the weather is like in the Bering Sea. It's kind of like red of it. You know, you watch this uh, where these guys are going up and uh, there's that that one show that they've got. Uh, and they're, they're, these, they're, they're trying to catch crab. But, you know, these storms mm -hmm. come in out of there. And so uh, we had a recovery one afternoon and the wind picked up to 75 knots. And it was raining. And we came in, but it was good enough to do what we call case one, just a visual recovery. And I can remember the guys calling out, you know, okay, you know, we're, you know, winds down the angle, 75 gusting to 82. I went, I don't even know where you turn because our normal is 24 to 26 knots over the deck. That's what we need for the cable and the physics of catching the airplane. It was like, oh, 75 knots. But then I could see the boat. The boat's doing this. Oh, and then you can hear them on the radio going, little power, 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 power. Wave it off, wave it off. They're just screaming at these guys. It's like, ay, ay, ay. I said, this is it's like a rodeo. And so we were catching one in five airplanes. And so I rolled into the groove. You know, I'm at, my heart's pounding. And I'm, want, and I'm trying to get, they're not using the usual reference that we use for landing because there's too much wind the, mm -hmm. the the stabilization system can't stay up with it, the glide slope that they present to you so they're doing it manually and so i'm watching it, but i watch a ship come up and the propellers were out of the water and they go boom, 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 boom. Oh i've never God. seen that like, they're 38 feet below the deck you know below the surface and it's like holy shit this the ship is so violently pitching and it's got like 52 feet of ramp movement, you know, so it's down 26 and it's up 26. And it's like, you need 14 to clear the deck for the wire, cross, you know, your hook to cross steel. So it's like, I'm going, oh my God, this is, this is unbelievable. And there, you're just reacting to what the guy's telling you to do. But I can remember that, you know, I didn't get aboard the first time I came around and they gave me another one and I could see, they go, okay, you know, decks, decks down, don't chase it. And so it's here, and I brought the airplane. It's just like, boom, just stuck it in there. It's like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one that was, you know, for the books. That was the, the most I'd ever landed in. And the most violent, you know, I've ever seen, you know, just taxiing around was hard because the deck was going everywhere. 
So they'd put chains on you immediately and chocks underneath you to a spot. And then we all got down that day away. You know, they just threw out all the grading and go, look, we're just, you know, we just need to catch everybody and get out of this, you know. So, That's yeah, nice. that was one that was a good one. Uh, let's see. I did have one in a Tomcat that was kind of hilarious. With I went out with my commanding officer. We're up in the North Atlantic. You know, this is during the Cold War. Russians, you know, the Soviet Union sending these waves of bombers out. You know where the GI-UK gap is. You've heard of that, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's up there. So it's Greenland, Iceland, the UK. And then up in that area, kind of up near the Arctic Circle, they're sending these airplanes out of the Soviet Union. Badgers, mm -hmm. bears, all these different airplanes. And so we would try to join them at a really long distance away from the carrier. And so my, my my commanding officer, he joins up on this badger. And the badger, you try to get so you can get pictures of it, you know, and they would have their bomb bays open so you could see that they weren't carrying a weapon. Yeah. And so this guy's doing this, but he's porpoising. And so my CO is getting madder and madder. And I can hear him. You know, we have two radios up, one main one, one comp that's tactical. And he goes, yeah, this asshole. <laughs> he's, I can't get near him because he's bobbing so much. Now, this is where opportunity and preparation come together. And for the longest time, I had been carrying this leather flying hat, but I had it all rigged so that my radios, I could hear everything. And I could take my mask off and kind of hook it up to it. And it was exactly like what the Russian guys were wearing in their airplanes. So we had seen seen them before, and they always wore these leather flying hats. And so it was like almost World War II type stuff. So I said to the guy in my backseat, I said, Hey, do you have do you have that gorilla mask with you? And he said, Yeah. And so he put his he he took his helmet off and he became a gorilla. And he, he it was a pretty good gorilla thing. And then <laughs> he's in the back, kind of acting like this monkey. And I'm in the front, and I had Groucho Marx glasses and a cigar. And so I said, uh, Skipper, let us give it a try. And he goes, ah, you can't do any better than me. And so he pulls over and we move up into this position, but just close enough that we can kind of get in sequence with the guy. And you could hear, you could see the guy in the back go, hey, stop bobbing up and down. We got to check this out. And so the airplane goes, boop, boop. And we close right up. And I mean to tell you, I mean, we're like five, six feet away from the tail gunner. And he's looking at us. He's laughing his ass off. He's like this. He goes like this. Ah, I like your hat, just like mine. <laughs> then the monkey, my gorilla in the back seat, he had these Playboy foldouts, and he's putting them up in the cockpit. And the guy goes, "You gotta go up to the cockpit and show him the Playboys." <laughs> so that was the kind of silly shit that we used to do, but it was a good story. And he's like, "How did you guys get joined up on him?" And in the end. We got right underneath them and we photographed the interior of the Bombay. And it was like, eh, we were the we were we were the heroes of the air wing that day, but <laughs> we kind of kept our secret with our our gorilla and my flying hat, you know. <laughs> that is a brilliant story. I love it. What a way to wrap it up to have a good laugh like that. So thanks for sharing it. But um, yeah, this has been uh, our four questions done for today. And before we wrap it up, it is time for what I like to call the shameless plug. It's a tradition and it has to happen. Now, look, let's put it this way. Like you said, you don't have much of a social media thing going on. You, you don't have anything to promote. But what you can do is if you want to promote something, you can promote someone that you have a lot of admiration for, that you want people to take a look at. Anything from history, a foundation, a book that's changed your life. Just, yep, have a shameless plug and just send people to go and have a look at something that you like or believe in. Okay. Um, there was a book that somebody insisted that I read. And I said, okay. And this guy pounded on me for, you know, half a year. And I said, oh, he goes, oh, you're a fighter pilot. You got to read it. It's the greatest book I've ever read. And so I said, okay, I'm going to get it. I'm going to read it. And I believe, and I'm, I I'm hope I'm not wrong, but it was a, it was a story of a bomber crew uh, B twenty, not a twenty four, the B twenty five, B twenty five. No, no, no. B seventeen, B seventeen's out of the UK. Mm -hmm. Okay, making these unescorted missions before the P fifty one was around into northern Germany to attack 
the infrastructure of northern Germany, you know, the, all the, the factories. And so it's the story of a German fighter pilot, very experienced, and an American bomber crew on their first mission. Greatest story I've ever read. Higher Calling, I believe it's what it's called. And it's about faith. It's about compassion. It's about, you know, your fellow man and having not, you know, not killing somebody to kill him. It was it was an incredible story. So you get a chance to read it. I mean, you're just going to go, wow. And in the end, you know, I hate to I hate to give the ending up, but or just a little hint. The two of them meet each other after the war. It's just a moving tale of combat. And uh, that's worth reading. That's one. Uh, I love the story about Shackleton and his journey down to the South Pole. Mm-hmm. You read that. You go, that's a story of survival. I think the ship was called Endurance. And they tried to cross the Antarctic with ponies, you know, at the turn of the century. It's this this thing just goes sideways. Read that An amazing okay. book. Those are two of my favorites. Then I want to plug something, and it's not really a plug. You know, I would dedicate this chat about Top Gun, and that is to uh, a gent passed away about two weeks ago. He was one of my real heroes, one of the guys that I was. Uh, I would you know you take your career, and if you continue, you go. That's who I want to be like. I want to be like him. His name is uh, Wiggs. Very normal upbringing. He was 10 years before me. Fighter pilot extraordinaire. Great adversary pilot. Commanding officer of VF-31. Uh, the Tomcatters at our squadron. He was, So he had a Tomcat squadron. He went on to co- be the commanding officer of Top Gun. And he went on to become an air wing commander, CAG-15. But uh, Rick Ludwig was his name, call sign Wiggs. And he just passed away a couple of weeks ago, rather unexpectedly. He was uh, the president of the Tailhook Foundation during all that mess that we had in, in 1991 with kind of a, a fallout with, uh, you know, a lot of challenges and things were changing. But uh, this this episode's to him. What, a, what an amazing individual should have been an admiral, would have easily been an admiral, but uh, he he really took on, you know, a lot of just crap that went down during tail hook. And he was the shield for all the rest of the guys, you know, to uh, take on the, the, sh- as the shit screen, we call it sometimes, is to champion the cause of naval aviation. But he was just such a fine man. That, this was the, that would be the guy I dedicate this episode to. Wow. And then I always talk about my wife and everything she does to support my craziness of continuing to fly at an advanced age. I would have been retired from the airlines about three years ago, but uh, just the support she always gives me for, uh, that's my wife, Jill, and uh, for my passion for flying, because I took something that I wanted to, as a profession and it was my passion. So it's never been much work. I've I've loved every moment of all the different airplanes I've flown. <sighs> that's so sweet so beautiful and um yeah tom i mean it reflects in the person you are and this is a great way to dedicate it to wigs and uh you mentioned there was a foundation there too could you please remind me of the name of that just so i can take note and make sure that people get get over to that too you know there is a tail hook foundation and they fund uh scholarships mm-hmm. for naval aviators naval flight officers their families the kids and so if there's a direct lineage between the two, there's a tail hook educational foundation. That's a good one to look up. If somebody says, Hey, how, how can I make a difference? That, that'd be a great one to go to. And that's right. kind of what, that was kind of one of the things he represented as the former president of the tail hook uh, foundation. So yeah. Yeah. It's uh, he was such a great guy. Awesome. Great stuff. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining me today for the talk for podcast. Honestly, you know what? This has been an absolute pleasure having you on and just an absolute honor for me. Thank you for doing this. Okay, Louie, I, 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 I'm still trying to remember how you found me, but it's it's kind of cool that you're sitting in the UK and here we are doing this from Vail, Colorado, but uh, you do a great job of your talk for and I'm going to keep enjoying them. Thank you so much, Tom. And uh, I'll tell you what, it wouldn't be any without the listeners and the people listening right now and supporting and showing all the love. So guys, 
thank you for listening episode 76 we've just done it now and if you'd like to listen to the past episodes go and have a look at the channel and if you'd like to listen in for the future ones make sure to hit that subscribe button and spread some love by leaving a like and a comment signing off for now and fights on cheerio mate (laughs)